It was late morning. We are on the trail in the Aishar Valley, South Vietnam, searching for enemy bunkers. We found them. We took a few rounds from the point. We were ordered 100 meters back up the trail to bring in artillery support. That would have taken an hour. That's the size of a football field, walking single file. And we walked for about 10 minutes, if that. We were about 100 men lined up on the trail. We're constantly crossing the stream as a reference point. We sat down on our rucks. I then heard nine mortar rounds come out of the tubes. That's right, I counted them. What else are you going to do sitting in a triple canopy jungle with mosquitoes bugging you? An artillery volley followed soon after that from some fire base. We were sitting on the trail where it crossed the stream. The stream is low, about six inches deep, maybe 10 feet across by about 15 feet wide. The first round hit about 50 meters away. The second walked into 25 meters away. Shrapnel was flying everywhere. I got up, I moved for cover, which was walking up the bank of the creek. It was worn out. It was like dug out somehow from the from people traveling. I sat in there and uh, the first round hit 50 meters. Then the second one walked in, right? Shrapnel was flying. The next thing, I sat down, someone sat next to me. I believe it was a, a platoon sergeant. I saw a flash, and the last thing I heard was a tremendous splash. Sp sorry, blast. And then I saw a torso with no limbs or head landing on the man next to me with a red, red smoke grenade punctured. And he screamed like a crazy man. Hollywood could never have made a scream worse than the scream. A few more rounds landed, and the artillery came in. I thought it was 155 rounds. Since then, some of the living thought so too. I got up and ran up front to the command group. I could smell the flesh burning and body parts were landing around. I was able to jump across the stream when a small foot fell in front of me. And I said, oh crap, that's Scotty's. He was on. He was a tunnel guy. I ran yelling, check fire, check fire. When I got to the command group, I saw a few men down, not knowing who was dead or wounded, but everything was crazy, moaning and screaming and dying. Then the first sergeant said things were under control. I went back to my squad. My platoon leader was dead, his RTO was dead, as well as my squad leader, and, and four of the other members of my squad. Several were wounded severely, and I lost my hearing and just got a little scratch on the head. At that time, the word came up to set up a perimeter. The enemy was probing us and sniping at us. If we were trying to take care of the wounded, the dead would take care of themselves. A little later, some choppers came out, dropped in chainsaws, and patrolled the skies with their machine guns protecting us as we cut out a landing zone in the jungle. A few hours later, we loaded choppers and the wounded and then the dead. Some of the guys had body parts missing. A few, a few of them looked okay, but at that point they were still dead. I was one of the last wounded out. I was ambulatory, just had a concussion, a loss of hearing in my left ear and a small cut on my forehead. I was sent to the 86th Devac Hospital in Quignon. I later found out that the second squad of the second platoon, my brothers took the worst hit. And here I am 50 years later. And that was that. So we went back to the base camp. The RTO, the Lieutenant's RTO, the radio telephone operator, guy used to carry the Trick 25 on his back. I never knew it till I got back that the shrapnel that killed him and our platoon leader was locked open from the explosion. And everybody in the brigade heard what was going on. The moaning and the screaming. It was pretty bad. I guess it doesn't get any worse than that. <laughs>